Paul said, tell me who you desire to be under the law. Let me rephrase that because that ain't what it said. It said, tell me you who desire to be under the law. Do you not hear the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bun woman and the other by a free woman. But he who was of the bun woman was born according to the flesh, and he of the free woman through promise, which things are symbolic. For these are two covenants, the one from Mount Sinai, which gives birth to bondage, which is Hagar. For this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, and corresponds to Jerusalem, which now is, and is in bondage to her children. But the Jerusalem above is free, which is the mother of us all. For it's written, Rejoice, O brethren, you who do not bear. Break forth and shout, you who are not in labor. For the desolate has many children, or has more children than she who has a husband. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are children of promise. But as he who was born according to the flesh then persecuted him who was born according to the Spirit, even so it is now. Nevertheless, what did the Scriptures say? Cast out the bond woman and her son, and her son, for the son of the bond woman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, you are not children of the bond woman, but of the free. Now, if you don't know anything at all about what's going on in Jerusalem and Israel today, then you won't understand this scripture. But if you understand this scripture, then you understand that the Palestinians and the Jews are never going to come together. Now, of all the politicians in the world can meet over there and do whatever they want to, this is a God thing and it's not going to happen. And so, that Paul uses this to teach us a lesson about freedom from the bondage of the law. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for your love and grace. Thank you for being here tonight. Thank you for each home, each individual, each person that's represented. Speak to us through your word. Glorify yourself. In Jesus' name, amen. So here is tonight's question. If you don't have it pulled up, how can a God-given desire cause such ungodly trouble. How can a God-given desire cause such ungodly trouble? Now, that's a good question. If God gave you this, this, this plan, this, his will for your life, how can that God-given desire, plan, will for your life lead to such ungodly problems? Well, the answer is when we try to accomplish God's purpose in human terms. Okay? When we try to accomplish God's purpose on, in our human flesh, in our human desire, in our own plans. So the story in our text tonight is about Hagar and Sarah, and it's about exactly the kind of trouble that, uh, that Paul has described here. God had given Abraham and Sarah a plan. Uh, uh, they had a desire to have a son, an heir. And God said, I'm going to give you a son. I'm going to give you an heir. And so that's what caused all this issue right here that happened thousands upon thousands of years ago that's going on today. All right? Since the Judaizers appealed to the law, Paul accepted their challenge, and then he uses the law to prove that Christians are not under the law. Okay, now remember this entire book of Galatians is about trying to get those of us that are saved to understand that we are not to live according to the law. We are not bound by do's and don'ts and cans and can'ts. We have been set free because of the finished work of Christ on the cross. And so that's what Paul, the whole message of this entire book is about. And he just takes this and this and this because he's writing to Jews that had embraced Christ and Christianity. And then there were another bunch of Jews that were uh, Jewish legalizers. And they were saying, yeah, you might have been saved by grace, but you can't stay saved by grace. 
You, you, you might have asked the Lord to come into your life and forgive your sins and make you a Christian, and he did, and then you were saved, but you can't stay that way. You have to do this and this and this and this and this, and you can't do this and this and this and this and this. And so that's what Paul is fighting against. And I'm telling you guys, it's still in our, it's still in our society, it's still in churches today. Major denominations are built on the same philosophy that Paul is talking against. So he takes a familiar story. Now, let me tell you something. Every Jew knows about Abraham and Sarah and Ishmael and, and Isaac. Genesis chapter 16 through all the way through chapter 21 draws us the basic truths of the Christian relationship to the law of Moses. At the same time, Paul uses this story to illustrate the problems and the consequences of our trying to short-circuit God's promises and how it relates to us today. So the first thing we're going to look at is the historical facts based on biblical truth. Verses 19 through 23 gives us this insight. My little children whom I labor in birth again until Christ is formed in you, I would like to be present with you now and to change my tone, for I have doubts about you. Tell me, you who desire to be under the law, do you not hear the law? Paul is saying, if you want to live under the law, listen to what you volunteered for. Listen to what you bought into. He said, if you would just take the time to read the law. Now, for it's written that Abraham had two sons. And he says now he's going to give a commentary on the question that he asked. One by a bun woman and the other by a free woman. But he who was of the bun woman was born according to the flesh, and he of the free woman through promise. So Paul points out the two problems of trying to accomplish God's purpose with my plan. Hello? Are y'all still with me so far? All right. The first problem is this. We tend to substitute our human schedule with God's schedule. Are, are, you, are you listening? Now listen, let me just be honest with you. I, I, I'm one of those real patient individuals. And when I pray and ask God for something, I, when I open my eye, I want to see it right there. Huh? Hello? Yeah. Now, don't act like you don't know what I'm talking about, because most of us in here got that same problem. You know, I mean, when we pray, I mean, here, here's, have you ever argued with Jesus about something? And I say, now, Lord, you know what you said in your word, and you told me your word don't lie, and you said in your word, if I ask believing, I can have it. I said, so I believe I've got it, now show it to me. Huh? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And so he goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 16, verses 1, 2, 3, 4. Now, Sarah, Abram's wife, has borne him no children, but she had an Egyptian maidservant named Hagar. So she said to Abram, now this is what's so awesome. Sarah's the one brought the idea up. You know, she wasn't from Alabama, son. I can just tell you that straight up. She'd have killed somebody. He would have been a eunuch before daylight. You know, let me just be honest with you here. So the Lord has kept me from having children. Then she blames it on God. You understand? It's God's fault. I'd have his kids already. If God just told me he was going to do what he said he was going to do. So, so go and sleep with my maidservant. I mean, yeah, I mean, you know, my maidservant. And perhaps I can build a family through her. And Abraham agreed. Now, who didn't think that was going to happen? <laughs> oh, let me see. Now, you just asked me to go have a relationship with our maidservant who's pretty, pretty sharp, hey, you know. Let me see. I'm going to think about it. Okay, I think we can do that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now, think about what's going on here. You know, you, you don't think Satan is smart? Listen, he's smooth as a mole, guys. Let me tell you. So... After Abram had been living in Canaan 10 years, Sarah, his wife, uh, and he agreed. And so uh, Sarah, his wife, took her, the Egyptian maidservant, Hagar, and gave her to her husband to be his wife. And he slept with Hagar, and she conceived. Now, Abraham, now, listen, guys, he really wasn't an idiot. He understood that God had a plan for 
through him, that is through Abraham, that he promised him that he was going to have an offspring, and through that offspring, God was going to bless the world. It was a good plan. It was an awesome plan. It was a divine plan. And Abraham knew that. He wanted a family, and he wanted a heritage. That's the rub. He knew God's plan was good and a divine plan and a sovereign plan. He understood all that, but he became impatient. Now, it's one thing for Abraham to become impatient. It's a whole other dog for Sarah to become impatient. Are you listening to me? There's just one problem. As far as Abraham was concerned, God didn't seem to be keeping his end of the promise. And he mulled it through his mind, and he mulled it through his mind, and he mulled it through his mind. And weeks turned into months, and months turned into years, and years turned into decades. He said he'd been in, how long? Been living in Canaan, 10 years. No baby. No, no conception. So, Sarah came to him in that moment. Isn't that the way Satan always operates? He always comes to you in a moment when you are more vulnerable. Sarah said to this man who was already in his mind questioning God's promise. Hmm? And she said, I have an idea. I'm going to tell you how we can fulfill God's promise for our life. I'm going to tell you how you can have an offspring that God's going to use to be a blessing to the entire world. The problem is Sarah's timing didn't match up with God's timing. And I'm sure that none of you have ever felt like God was taking a little bit too long to accomplish the things you wanted in your life. I think that's how sometimes, you may not agree with what I'm going to say, but I think that's sometimes how he, he builds up our faith. Hmm? Listen, you can fight or you can fold. It's just that simple. When you're going through the storms of life, you've got two choices. You can fight or you can fold. And I'm going to tell you it's a sad epitaph on the church of the living God because far too many of God's children fold in the storms of life. Most of our lives, certainly not all of our lives, God has given us a plan. God has a plan. That plan includes marriage, ultimate romantic, and sexual fulfillment. That's God's plan. God said it's not good for man to be alone. That's what he said. Isn't that what he said? The word is loneliness. God looked at Adam and he said, it's not good for that man to be alone, to live in loneliness. So he created a woman from Adam. And so most of us today, we, we end up being, you know, teenagers and fall in love and want to get married and sometimes we do and sometimes we don't. Sometimes we do and wish we didn't. No, that's another whole story. <laughs> but it's easy to get impatient and try to short circuit God's plan for our life. It's easy to allow a God-given desire to give way to something ungodly. I'm convinced that most of us really want what God wants for us. I believe with that, out of my heart. I believe most Christians really want what God wants for us because most of us believe that God has a good plan for us. Isn't that right? Yeah. What did he say in Jeremiah? I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They're plans for good and not for disaster. Isn't that what the Bible says? So God's got a plan, and we believe that, and we believe God has a good plan for us. The problem is we get impatient. Because God's timing and my timing and your timing are not all the way the same. You know why? This. You know what this thing right here is called? Wait, I'm going to show it to you. You know what that's called? A timepiece. You want me to tell you an amazing thing? There's no time with God. God doesn't have one of these on his arm. Hmm? In fact, Peter said a day with God is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like a day. You know what he's trying to say? He's trying to say, don't worry about it. God's not keeping time. The problem is, you and I live on time schedules. Isn't that right? Yeah, amen. 
I mean, all of us are on some kind of schedule. It's either a work schedule or, or, or a medicine schedule or appointment schedules. or it's, All of us live by this sucker right here. Isn't that right? You know what? We allow it to govern our lives. Let me give you an example. Every, every day, every morning, I take three chemo pills. That's 1,500 milligrams apiece. 20 minutes before I take those three chemo pills, I have to take a pill called Zofran. The Zofran is to keep those chemo pills from making me sick as a dog. So I take the Zofran 20 minutes. And then I, between the time I take that Zofran, I have to eat. Because if I don't eat and I take those chemo pills, then the, then the chemo pills and the Zofran's coming back up. You, you understand? So... I get in, I get in, and here, here's the deal. I've only got a 12-hour range that I can take those chemo pills. I have to take those chemo pills every day between 8 and 8.45 every day. And that's after I've gotten up and eaten. And so I have to keep a log of it. And when I go back to Duke, I have to give that lady that log that says I kept these, this thing. And then she asked Linda, if, did he do this? <laughs> Obviously, she don't realize this beautiful face I have is honest. All right, maybe she does. But anyway, so we're on this time frame. And, uh, all, but all of us are. If you're on any kind of medication, normally are, you know that you're going to take these in the morning, these at night. You, you, you understand? If you're going to pick your kids up from, from kindergarten or school or whatever it is, if you're going to take them, you know you have to have them at a certain time. If you're going to pick them up, you have to pick them up at a certain time. If you're going to a doctor's appointment, you just go to the doctor. If you've got a doctor's appointment at 10 o'clock, you need to be there at 10 o'clock, and then you'll get to see him at 2. Yeah. I mean, now, but all of us are on some kind of a time plan. And because we are time-driven, we allow that natural, normal part of our life to interfere with God's timing. Isn't that, isn't that amazing? You know, and so when that happens, we try to hurry God up. Have you ever noticed that God had never decided to get on my new schedule yet? It, I think he's pretty content just to be on the schedule he's on, you know? So it's, it, we are kind of like, now look, let me just be honest with you. I'm going to tell you something I know you don't know. I love fried chicken. Mm -hmm. That's the reason I went into ministry. I had a desire for chicken, not for work. <laughs> I mean, I, sort of, I fell in love with fried chicken and decided I didn't like my job. I thought, this is it. God's called me to preach, bless God. <laughs> Somebody's actually go hear this on YouTube and think that's the truth, you know. But let me tell you how impatient people do. Let's just suppose that you go to the uh, chicken place. I almost called a couple of names, but I decided I better not I'd get sued. You go to the chicken place, and there is a, a cook that's frying the chicken. And, and he's about to get behind on all his little things hanging down up here. So he turns, it, he turns the fryer up just a little bit higher, and just a little bit higher, and he puts all the chicken in there. And when it gets nice and crispy brown, he puts it all up and puts it out here. And guess what? It's not done inside. It looks good, smells good, but when you cut it open, it bleeds on you. Huh? You say, what's that have to do with the night's Bible study? It has everything to do with it because that's what's happening in too many of our lives. As long as we can make it look good and smell good, then we'll take it up. But when we get to the heart of things, it wasn't ready. You see? And the second problem is we try to accomplish a godly purpose in our human strength. Verse 23 says, And his son by the slave woman was born in the ordinary way. But his son by the free woman was born as a result of a promise. When Abraham tried to short-circuit God's plan, he tried to do it in his own power, in his own strength, in his own ability. 
He knew there wasn't anything that he could accomplish without Sarah being conceived. He understood that. He, and so he was waiting patiently, and she was waiting patiently until they both started waiting what? Impatiently. Now, Abraham understood that, that, that if he got the slave girl pregnant, that he would probably have a son. He would become, uh, have an heir. But it wasn't satisfying. You know why? Because it didn't fulfill the longing that God had put in his heart. Now, I want you to listen to me carefully. A substitute will never fill the place of the real thing. Are y'all listening to what I'm telling you? A substitute will never fill the place of a real thing. You can do it, try all you want to. He knew it wasn't God's plan. It was man's attempt to manufacture something that looked like God's plan. It wasn't done in God's power. It was done in man's weakness. And so here's the application of the illustration that Paul is teaching us these last few weeks in the book of Galatians. This is the weakness of the slavery of the law. Now listen to me carefully, guys. Legalism will never give you the satisfaction of the real thing that God has for your life called grace. It doesn't satisfy because it's not the same thing as Christ being formed in you through the work of the Holy Spirit, transforming your life and transforming your desire. Slavery to the law amounts to our looking at God, what wants for our life, and trying to manufacture something that looks good to him. Hmm. Have you ever done that? All of us have whether we want to admit it or not. Because here's the deal. Sometimes in our life, now I'm going to talk to you from your friend and your preacher. And so if I don't have a job tomorrow, that's okay. <laughs> but there's sometimes in my life I don't really like being a preacher. I wouldn't trade it for anything in the world, but there's sometimes in my life I don't really like being a preacher. Now, I want you to listen to me. Because it's those times when I have to fake it. Are y'all listening to what I'm telling you? Sometimes, there's sometimes, guys, when I really don't like to stand up and laugh and joke and have a party. Sometimes I just like to go off in a room by myself, get along with God, and try to unload myself to Him. You understand what I'm saying? It's those times in life when we become the hypocrite. <laughs> not me. Well, you lying like a dog. <laughs> All of us have. Amen. Hello? Amen. These folks are, I'm not going to come to church as hypocrites in there. Well, come on, join us. <laughs> come on down. You'll fit right in that crowd I pastor. Yeah. So how do you know? Because I fit right in with them, bless God. Yeah. Sometimes we all fake it. Huh? That's what Paul is talking about here. You see, sometimes, when we don't feel that anointing on our life, sometimes when we don't feel that warmth coming from God on our lives, we fake it. We think if I do, if I go to church every Sunday and every Sunday night, Wednesday night, and if I sing and shout and smile and shake hands and hug necks, then, then I'll just fake it till I make it. Hmm? You say, what? Well, what's the alternative? The alternative ain't good either. Because the more you stay out, the more hard it is to get back. Hmm? Because what happens is, you know what? We have an enemy. How many of you know we have an enemy? Hold on You know what he's going to say? You are a hypocrite. And you know what messes him up? Is when I say, you are right. <laughs> you know what? You know what I've just done? He, he takes his claws and goes, Paul is saying the law doesn't make you any more godly, doesn't make you any more righteous. Do's and don'ts and cans and can'ts doesn't make you any closer to God, doesn't make you any more anointed of God, doesn't make God love you anymore, doesn't make you any more 
more, any more special in the eyes of God just because you're trying your best. You're going to wear yourself out spiritually and emotionally trying to keep a set of rules put together by a set of men who couldn't keep it themselves. I'm going to tell you something, and you can tell him I said so. No legalistic preacher has ever lived up to the sermons he's preaching. I don't care who he is. And you tell if you don't like to come see me. If he's bigger than I am, bring somebody with you. <laughs> because this word of God from which I teach and preach says the law was never given that people could obey it. It was given to show people that they simply could not obey it. Paul refers to it as a schoolmaster. What I'm talking about here tonight, ladies and gentlemen, is something that is a quantum leap for far too many of our churches today. Because far too many of us, far too many of us have set under the preaching of a preacher that taught you sermons of fear. Mm -hmm. God's going to get you for that. You ever heard that? Bless God, they're coming today. You'll pay for that. Mm -hmm. That's like the moron that said, all the people in my church tithe. Some of it give it and God takes the rest of it. What an idiot. God doesn't have to take anything from you. You don't even want what you got. He just wants to bless you because you give it to him. Isn't that right? That's what God is about. It's called G-R-A-C-E, grace. So let's look at the consequences of doing what we've been talking about. Y'all going to make me run out of time if you're not careful. Man's way causes separation between you and the fellowship with God. Verses 1 and 30, at that time, the son born in the ordinary way persecuted the son born by the power of the Holy Spirit. It is the same now. What does the scripture say, Paul says? Get rid of the slave woman and her son, for the slave woman's son will never share in the inheritance with the free woman's son. What did I say to start this study? What's going on in Israel and Palestinians will never be settled through political endeavors because it's a God thing. Immediately when Sarah and Abraham attempt to take the shortcut to God's plan, there is broken fellowship. You say, well, how do you know? Because the woman that came to the husband and said, I've got a plan. Why don't you go sleep with our, with our maid servant who is by the name of, what? Hagar. That was her name, wasn't it? Wasn't it? Yeah, that's what my Bible said. I just checked to make sure. Then the child was born. Abraham's son. Answer to God's prayer. Blah, blah, blah. What happened? Sarah began to hate Hagar. Begin to hate Hagar. And, and the hatred began to bloom until everybody in that little setting hated everybody. Why? Because there is a great difference between a promise and a placebo. Abraham and Sarah are dissatisfied with the outcome of their plan because they knew in their heart they were disobedient to God. You want me to tell you the hardest Christians in the world to get along with? Christians that are living in disobedience to God. Hmm? They have issues. They have, they have spiritual issues. They have issues with God. Conversely, they have issues with themselves, and then the enemy steps in and starts putting a guilt complex on them, and now they're really messed up. Because of their guilt complex, they're too ashamed to come back to church because they think everybody in church knows what they've done, and what's so amazing is nobody in church cares except the people that they've hurt. And they don't come back anymore either because they don't want to go to church with the same crowd. Huh? 
When we're enslaved to the law, we are disappointed because we don't experience the full and joyful life that God intends for us to have. Paul then says, get rid of the slave woman and her son, for the slave woman's son will never share in the inheritance. I think Paul's way of making it clear that when you mix grace and works together, such as the Judaizers were suggesting, it's never going to work out. The second consequence of trying to accomplish God's plan, man's way, is slavery. Verse 25 says, Now Hagar stands for Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to the present city of Jerusalem because she is in slavery with her children. Slavery to sin causes the desire itself to drive us. It consumes us. Well, y'all too quiet on me. Let me just be honest with you. There was a time in my life that I was in bondage to drugs. I was the slave. And it dominated my life. I would steal a dime out from under a dead man's eye to get enough to get me one more fix. I would beat you until you could not stand up to get enough money to get one more fix. It drove my life. So I pray, yeah, go ahead and talk about your old sorry self if you want to. You want me to tell you something else? There's some of you in the same fix. In the same fix. It might not be the drugs and it might not be the alcohol. It might not be the pornography. It might not be some of these other things. But I'm going to tell you something. I know some folk that are not here, not none of you, that are in bondage to food. Hmm? You shut your big old 350-pound belly up to the table and talk about me being in bondage to drugs if you want to. You're in the same boat except your boat's sinking faster than mine because you way more than I did. You said, Preach, I don't, I don't even like this Bible study tonight. <laughs> well, you might as well get over it because you know what I'm telling you is the truth. Yeah, amen. Yeah. Whatever is the dominant force in your life is your God. That's what you're in bondage to. The drug addict on the street has less freedom than the convict in the jail. Did you know that? Trust me, I've been in both of them. Are you listening? I had more freedom to do what I wanted to do when I was in jail than I did when I was on the street. Hmm? You said, well, I don't know if I believe that or not. Well, don't, don't run that test for yourself. <laughs> Just uh, take my advice. Amen. <laughs> the point ultimately is this. The kind of fulfilled life that God intends for us to have. But we intend to fulfill it through our own desires. Causes us to substitute the counterfeit for the real. The counterfeit for the real. Slavery to the law is no better, ladies and gentlemen. Though we may be working for what seems obviously to be God's will for our lives, we do not do it out of love for God's best, but out of constraint, out of fear, out of obligation. Like the groom at a shotgun wedding, doing what's right, but there's no joy, only burden. Fortunate for us, we don't have to be slaves to either sin or the law. Isn't that awesome? Because God's grace has appeared in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. God wrote a letter to young Titus that God's grace teaches us to say no to sin. It doesn't force us to say no to sin. It just simply teaches us to say no to sin. The Holy Spirit living in us helps us to understand what's God's best for us. 
and helps us to fulfill it, not out of fear, but out of understanding. Paul said, therefore, brothers, we are not children of the slave woman, but of the free woman. The word of God said what the son, who the son has made free, is free indeed. You say, well, preacher, I, I, I don't know. What are you saying? I'm saying tonight I stand before you free. I stand before you free. Because of a choice. I choose to be free. Has it been easy? No. I made a statement from the pulpit about three Sundays ago it caused people to swallow their chewing gum. And I've said it down here. All, all of you, there's, no, there's about as much transparency in my life as there is that pane of glass right over there. It's been 50-something years I've been free from drugs. I may not mean anything to you. Bless God, it means a lot to me. Amen. Daphne and I were talking a while ago. The other day I was talking to my grandson and we were, I didn't have a shirt on like this. And he said, Papa, you got scars all over you. I said, yeah, I know it. He said, what that, that, what that scar, that scar comes, that's where I wrecked the motorcycle. He said, what that scar come from? I said, that's where I fell off of swimming, but diving pool and hit the side of the swimming pool. And he went, he, you know, I, he was wanting me to name all the scars. I'm thinking, Lord, I can't, I'm not going to live. I'm going to miss my next appointment at Duke, you know. Hold on, I'll get there. I said, son, look at me. I said, these are the scars that you can see. The hardy scars that your papa has, only God and I know for sure. But you know what? When he sees me through the eyes of the blood, he doesn't see the scars anymore. That's what grace is about. It's not about do's and don'ts and cans and can'ts. It's about getting up every day of your life and making a choice. This is a day the Lord's made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Wow. Man, what a good study. I'd come to this church if I wasn't a preacher. (laughs) Preaching probably wouldn't be as good, but I'd come anyway. (laughs) 